This lesson is an introduction into the macromolecules that make up living things. Specifically, I'm going to cover the bonding of these macromolecules, carbohydrates and lipids. In the second lesson, I'll go over proteins and nucleic acids. Life is too big to be made of simple molecules. If you look at the scale proportion and quantity in this image, you can see that an atom is only about 0.1 nanometers. Here, lipids and proteins are between 1 to 10 nanometers. A virus doesn't even get to about 100 nanometers, and we have to go upwards to a micrometer to reach a bacteria, some of the smallest living things that we've currently discovered. Then we get to micrometers for animal cells and plant cells, and up to millimeters and meters for things you can see with your naked eye, like an ostrich egg and a chicken egg. Because living systems are so large, they can't be made of only atoms. They need to be made of large molecules that we call macromolecules, and they're called this because of how large they are on the scale to a normal atom or molecule. So the first thing I want us to try to do is can we just describe the composition of the macromolecules required for living organisms? What is an amino acid, fatty acid, carbohydrate, and nucleic acid made of in terms of its atoms? Well, 96% of life is made up of only four elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The remaining 4% is mostly phosphorus, calcium, sulfur. That's it, life is made of only those elements. The thing is, everything on Earth is limited. How are organisms gonna be able to get these elements to grow, reproduce, and maintain organization? They're gonna be exchanging this matter with their environment. Everything on Earth is interdependent, so you have these non-living atoms cycling through living organisms, and those living organisms, through their waste and through death and decay, return those atoms back to the non-living environment. Carbon is going to be the foundational element of organic chemistry. Why, is, are, are, why are all of these macromolecules based in carbon? Well, carbon is unique in that it can form up to four bonds. When these form together, they form something called a hydrocarbon, a carbon completely saturated by hydrogens. Here's just a three-dimensional view of a hydrocarbon. What's unique with hydrocarbons is they can combine together to form large chains. Again, we need to make giant macromolecules in order to make things at the scale of a living thing. So let's try and see if we can just see where is the carbon in the big four macromolecules we need to learn about. Here's a carbohydrate, here is a lipid, here is a protein, and here is a nucleic acid. Looking at these four, can you find carbon atoms in each? My hope is yes, they immediately jump out. Carbohydrates, you can see every corner of this carbon ring has a carbon, and you can see carbon right here. Lipids have long chains of hydrocarbons. Proteins have a central carbon and, off, and oh, oh, pretty much always a carbon on the side. And nucleic acids are made up of a carbon ring. Nitrogen is another element that plays a big role in these four macromolecules. Specifically, I can find nitrogen in proteins. You can see it right there. And I can find in nu nucleic acids in a structure known as its nitrogenous base. These elements, just like every other element, are obtained from the environment. It's always an interdependent cyclical process. Phosphorus is another one that's significant, specifically for nucleic acids. All of them have a phosphate group and a special lipid known as a phospholipid. It has a phosphate group at the top of the molecule. These two are circulated through the environment. So I want us to try and just identify what elements are in each because it's very helpful when you're trying to identify before, between the big four. So let's start with carbohydrates. Can you identify what elements are in a carbohydrate? Give it a shot. Hopefully you noticed a carbohydrate is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We have plenty of carbons in this ring, hydrogen's off to the side, and oxygen's, and that's it. Carbohydrate is called a carbohydrate because it is carbon and water, HO. Let's try it now with lipids. What atoms make up a lipid? Same thing as the carbohydrates. A lipid is made up of only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if you were going to try to identify between the two based on what atoms they're made of, not that helpful. But if you look at their shape, you can see carbohydrates, not always, but typically are a ring, whereas lipids have these long hydrocarbon chains. Let's try proteins now. Try and identify the atoms in a protein. So a protein has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but it also has nitrogen. 
So if you're comparing a protein to carbs and lipids, that is a great tell that you're working with the protein. If that nitrogen is there along with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you could be working with a protein. Last one, what atoms are in a nucleic acid? A nucleic acid has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. It has all of these elements. So if you see nitrogen and phosphorus, you immediately know you're dealing with a nucleic acid. If you see carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and a nitrogen, it's a protein. And if you only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you need to look at the structure of each one to see if it's a carbohydrate or a lipid. So now let's look at how these molecules bond together. Specifically for a carb, a lipid, a protein, and a nucleic acid, how are all of these elements combining to make these larger molecules? So we're going to do two different kinds of chemical reactions. One's called a hydrolysis and another called a dehydration synthesis in order to build and break molecules. But what are these things we're building and breaking? Well, in every macromolecule, there are short repeating units. You can see with these three units here, there's two white circles and a black circle, two white circles and a black circle. When we have small individual units, we call those monomers. A monomer is a molecule that can be bonded to other identical molecules to form a larger molecule. When we combine these individual monomers together, we get something that looks like this. Notice that it's made out of the same repeating monomers, two white and a black, two white and a black, same unit repeating again and again. When you have a large molecule like this made out of identical monomers, we call it a polymer, a large molecule made of repeating subunits. So when we talk about bonding in a moment, you need to think of it as combining monomers to make a polymer or breaking a polymer apart to get back to its monomer parts. Here's an example with carbohydrates. You can see one carbon ring here called a monosaccharide as a monomer, and we're combining that same monomer together to make a large polymer. So how are we gonna build a polymer from a monomer? Well, if you look here, you'll see we have our green circle monomer, and on one end there's an H, on the other end there's an OH. If the hydroxyl and the hydrogen combine, those can be pulled out and form a water molecule. That water molecule then goes away, and now I have bound together those two monomers. Because a water is removed from this to bond two monomers together into a polymer, we call it a dehydration reaction or dehydration synthesis, the formation of covalent bonds between monomers by the removal of water. Here's another example with carbohydrates. Here you can see two monomers. Here I have a hydroxyl and a hydrogen. Those combine, a water is removed, and the remaining oxygen is used to bond the two together. To break apart a polymer, we need to do the same reaction in reverse. Since pulling out a water with a dehydration reaction is what formed it, to break it, we just need to reinsert the water. That water is going to be reinserted that's used to break the bond, and now we're returning to our two original monomers. This reaction is called hydrolysis or a, dehyd sorry, a digestion reaction. It's using water to break the bonds between monomers. Here you can see it with carbohydrates. We have this carbohydrate polymer. We add a water, it breaks that oxygen bond there and returns to the two original monomers. So again, just in summary, if I'm combining two monomers, I'm going to do a dehydration reaction that's going to pull it out. And if I'm breaking a polymer apart, I'm going to add water. Something to think about is that water is constantly, life is constantly cycling between these two processes. If you're going and eating a giant meal, you're eating giant molecules. You're breaking them down. You're performing hydrations. But when you break it down, you're going to use all of those molecules to build something. You're going to reproduce. You're going to grow. To do that, you need to take those smaller parts and combine them into larger molecules. That hydrolysis is going to be followed by a dehydration. You're going to use that to build up new structures. And this repeats again and again and again. Life is a sustained chemical process. It's a sequence of hydrolysis and dehydrations. If you've ever wondered why you need to drink water to survive, this is why. Water is an essential component for doing a hydrolysis reaction or a dehydration reaction. Let's practice. Here I have two amino acid monomers. Could you describe how these two monomers can be combined into a polymer? And can you identify the type of bond that must occur? 
Well, in this example, if I'm combining, I need to do a dehydration reaction. I need to take a water molecule out to form a bond. Here, I have a carbohydrate polymer. Could you describe how this polymer can be broken apart into monomers? And what type of reaction must occur for that to happen? Since I'm breaking, I'm going to do a hydrolysis. Water is going to be inserted where all those covalent bonds are, and that's going to be used to break apart this polymer into individual monomers. So let's get into the nitty gritty of each of these macromolecules. Specifically, I'm going to talk about carbohydrates and lipids. We want to know what the structure and the function for these molecules are. So what carbohydrates, they're made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They have quite a few functions. The primary function is short-term energy. Carbohydrates are the most ideal energy source for living things. They're also found to make up pretty uh, sturdy structures. In cell walls, you will find carbohydrates in the form of cellulose. They also make up the exoskeletons of insects and crustaceans. Carbohydrates are called such because they're made of a carbon and a water. Specifically, most carbohydrates follow this formula of CH2O. If I have a monomer, it can be one unit that I call a monosaccharide. Saccharide means sugar, mono means one. And here's the molecular formula for the one I'm showing you, glucose. It follows that CH2O formula. For every one carbon, there's one oxygen and two hydrogen, C6H12O6. If I have two monomers bound together in the case of carbohydrates, we call that a disaccharide. Di is two, saccharide sugar. And here's the molecular formula for sucrose. It roughly follows the same formula. There can be deviation at times. In biology, there's always exceptions to every rule. And if I were to combine more than two sugars, I would have a molecule that we call a polysaccharide, poly mini saccharide sugar, and this is cellulose. Sugars almost always end in the name os, and most of the time they come in carbon ranks. Here you can see the six carbon sugar glucose and the five carbon sugar ribose. However, there are instances of carbohydrates in chains. The way you can identify it is by looking at the atoms that make it up and how many carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens there are. Here I have three carbons, three oxygens, one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. So it's still following that CH2O formula. We're going to build sugars by performing a dehydration, and we're going to break sugars by forming a hydration. The way these sugars combine together does have a direct consequence on the function of the sugars. Here you're seeing a diagram of starch, which is how plants store their energy, and a diagram of glycogen, which is how animals store their energy. Notice that glycogen has many more branches compared to the starch. This is a direct result on its structure and its function. With glycogen, this is how carbohydrates are stored in the liver of animal bodies. This is rapidly accessible energy. Because it's branching apart, it's very easy for organisms to go in and break those bonds and get energy. Whereas with starch, it is a much sturdier molecule. And that's because there's less branching and there's more helix together. It is more difficult to extract energy from a starch molecule because of this. There are common isomers in carbohydrates. Just a call back to our lesson before. Here you can see in starch, the OH group is on the bottom, whereas with this beta glucose here in cellulose, it is pointing upward. Anytime there's a change in the structure, there is a change in the function. So let's look at lipids now. Here you can see a picture of a common lipid. The function of lipids is, or you lipids are oils. They're things like butter and fat, and their function is energy. They're also used for things like insulation and the cell membrane. The cell membrane is completely covered in lipids. They're also used for cell communication. This is how cells are going to be able to talk to one another. They're going to throw balls of fat at one another. So a lipid has two primary parts. There's a backbone here that we refer to as a glycerol, and attached to that glycerol are long fatty acid chains. Those fatty acid chains can come in two varieties. They can be either saturated, you can see here every carbon is completely saturated by a hydrogen bond, or they can be what we call unsaturated, where there is a breakage in that saturation by hydrogens. 
What causes this? This carbon-carbon double bond here. Nothing is necessarily broken off, but because of that carbon-carbon double bond, there are less hydrogen surrounding it. This is what it looks like in a three-dimensional view. You can see with a saturated fat, those fatty acid tails are stacked on top of each other, whereas with an unsaturated fat, there's a lot of branching and a lot of movement. Because of this, saturated fats are solid at room temperature. These make up things like butter. And it's because of that close proximity of the bond. Solids have atoms that are very close to each other, liquids are further apart, and gases are even further apart. Since the unsaturated has this branching, it's actually liquid at room temperature. So an easy way to know what kind of fat you're working with is to just look at it. If it's liquid, it's an unsaturated fat. If it's solid, it is a saturated fat. There's also a special lipid called the phospholipid. The phospholipid is found in cell membranes, and what's unique about it is it has a phosphate group where the glycerol normally is and fatty acid chains running off of it. This gives it unique properties. That phosphate head is going to be polar and hydrophilic, it meaning it loves water. The tails, though, they are nonpolar. They're hydrocarbons. They're hydrophobic. This is why you find these lipids in the cell membrane. Water can't get into the middle because it's nonpolar, but water can attract to the phosphate heads on either side. Just another reminder, because this question does show up frequently in AP Biology, saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Since they're all carbon-carbon single bonds, those atoms are close to each other. One unfortunate thing about eating a lot of saturated fats like butter is since it's solid, if it gets into your body and gets inside your arteries and veins, it can create a blockage. We refer to that as arthiosclerosis or plaque deposits. This is different than an unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fats are better for you in terms of health. Since they're liquid, you don't have that plaque arthiosclerosis problem that you do with solid saturated fats. These are liquid at room temperature because of that carbon-carbon double bond. Those kinks cause further movement between the lipid tails. And here's just another diagram of the phospholipid. A reminder what makes them unique is the phosphate group attached to the top. That makes that region polar and attractive to water. These are found in cellular membranes, and we'll learn these in more detail later in this class. Another special kind of lipid is a steroid. Steroids look nothing like the other lipids. They're actually four carbon rings fused together. What makes a steroid unique is this is used as a communication molecule and used to regulate genes in your body. Some great examples are cholesterol. It's found in the cell membrane and makes things more fluid. And sex hormones, testosterone, and estrogen, the things that can cause genes to turn on or off in different cells to cause different genetic expression. So we've covered carbohydrates, lipids, and how they bond together. Next time, we're going to cover nucleic acids and proteins. I know this is a lot of detail. I hope this video helps somewhat in being introduced to those different structures, and I will see you next time.